Good morning. Welcome to Royal City Community Church. We're so glad that you could join us again today. We are continuing our study, Bible study in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be looking at about verses 8 through about 19 today, see where we get with that. But let's just open up with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for today. We thank you for just this opportunity, as always, that we have to look into your word. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you want to reveal to us as we continue to study uh, Hebrews, and especially uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and the aspects of faith. So we thank you for just being with us, for strengthening us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as I said, we're looking at verses 8 through 19. I'm not going to read the whole verse at this time, uh, but basically, uh, there's a, little, a few points that I want to get through today, um, so I want to sort of get on my horse with that today. But there, in essence, there's only two ways to live. One way, which is of course by far the most common, is to live by sight, to base everything on what we can see. And this is the this is the typical way, okay? The other far less common way is to live by faith, to base your life primarily and ultimately on what you cannot see. Now, the Christian way is, of course, the, the way of faith. Uh, we've never seen God, or we've never seen Jesus Christ, heaven, hell, the Holy Spirit. We've never seen any of the people who wrote the Bible, or an original manuscript of the Bible. Though we see the results of them, we've never seen any of the virtues that God commands, or any of the graces that he gives. Yet we live in the conviction of all these things by faith. We bank our earthly lives and also our eternal destiny on things which we have never seen. That is the way the people of God have always lived. Now, of course, as we've been waking, making our way through the book of Hebrews, and especially chapter 11, we've talked about um, we've talked about Abel, we've talked about Enoch, last week was Noah. Today we're going to talk about Abraham. And in this passage of scripture, verses 8 through 19, which we trust I'm going to get through most of this today, um, there are five features of faith that show us the complete pattern. There's the pilgrimage of faith, the patience of faith, the power of faith, the positiveness of faith, I'll get that out, and the proof of faith. So let's break each one of these down. Let's look at chapter 11 and verse 8 by discussing the, pro the pilgrimage of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Now, it was not Abraham's plan to leave Ur, and then Haran, and eventually settle in the land of Canaan. In fact, when he left Ur, he had no idea where he was going. He was called by God, and only God knew what was in store for him. Now, in the Greek, that, that, that part that says he was called is a present part of participle. Part of participle, I'll get that out. And the translation could be when he was being called. In other words, as soon as he understood what God was saying, he started packing his bags, all right? It, it was instant obedience. It may have taken several days, maybe it took weeks, months, we don't know, to make final preparations for that trip. But in his mind, he was already on the way. From then on, everything he did revolved around obeying God's call. Now, Abraham, he was a sinful heathen. Uh, who grew up in an unbelieving and idolatrous society. Uh, or the Chaldees, they, were, they worshipped the moon. So he was called out of an idolatrous situation. Um, but we don't know exactly how or when God first made himself known to Abraham, but he was raised in a home that was pagan. A uh, native uh, city of Ur was in Chaldea, a uh, general region called Mesopotamia, which is, of course, between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Fertile land was, it was culturally advanced, it was near where the Garden of Eden was located, and was some 140 miles from where the great city of Babylon would one day be built. Isaiah refers to Abraham as the rock from which you were hewn, and the quarry from which you were dug, Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. Revealing, sorry, reminding his fellow Jews that God sovereignly condescended to call Abraham out of paganism and idolatry in order to bless him, and of course the world through him. He may have had higher moral standards than his friends and neighbors, but this was not the reason that God chose him. God chose him because he wanted to choose him. And when God spoke to him, he listened. When God promised, he trusted. And when God commanded, he obeyed. Amen. When any person comes to Jesus Christ, God demands of him a pilgrimage from his old pattern of living 
pattern of living, pardon me, into a new kind of life. Just as Abraham's faith separated him from paganism and unbelief and started him toward a new land and a new kind of life. Uh, of course, we know 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, all things have become new. So salvation brings separation from the world. The Lord works in the heart the total willingness to leave behind everything that is not pleasing to him. He cannot lead us into new ways of living until he leads us out of the old. We should respond, I, I don't know what you're going to do with me, Lord, but I'm going to drop all these old things. I don't know what you're going to substitute for them, but I'm going to let them go. See, that's the attitude of the faith pilgrim. The life of faith begins with the willingness to leave one's herb. We all have an herb, okay? Uh, one's own place of sin and unbelief to leave the system of the world. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2 tells us, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the, the will of God, good, acceptable, and perfect. See, giving up the old life and is one of the greatest obstacles to coming to Christ. And it's also one of the greatest obstacles to faithful living once we are in Christ. From the perspective of the old life and the old nature, the new life in Christ can appear, you know, very dull, very unexciting. When we think the way, sorry, when we think this way, we fail to understand that once we become a Christian, we're given a new set of values and interests and desires that we cannot experience in advance. We cannot see, as it were, the blessings and satisfaction of life in Christ before we trust him as our Lord and Savior. We believe and then we experience. We must first be willing to go to him outside the camp, okay? Be, uh, bearing his reproach, for here we, we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Hebrews 13, 13 tells us that. See, so often the reproach is all we are able to see at first. Uh, we look forward to the city which is to come. Now, the force that makes us want to hold on to the old is, you're familiar with this term, is worldliness. Worldliness may be an act, but primarily it is an attitude. It is wanting to do things that are sinful, selfish, and worthless, whether we actually do them or not. It's wanting men's praise, whether we receive it or not. It, 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 it's an out, outwardly holding to high standards of conduct, but inwardly longing to live like the rest of the world. Uh, the worst sort of worldliness is religious worldliness, because it pretends to be godly. It holds to God's standards outwardly, usually, usually adding a few of its own but it's motivated by selfish, worldly desires. It's pretentious and hypocritical. This is the Pharisee's great sin, as Jesus so often pointed out. And worldliness is not so much what we do as what we want to do. It's not determined so much by what our actions are, but by where our heart is. Some people do not commit certain sins only because they're afraid of the consequences, others because of what people will think, others from a sense of self-righteous satisfaction in resisting, all the while having a, having a strong desire for those sins. It's the desire for, it is the desire for sin that is the root of worldliness and from which the believer is to be separated. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the world, uh, the love of the Father is not in him. So, uh, 1 John 2.15 and James chapter 4, verse 4. The root meaning of holiness is separation. Being set apart from God. See, one of the surest marks of the demise of worldliness is a change in desires, in loves. We talked about this past Sunday, uh, the previous Sunday, uh, December the 12th Sunday service, talking about falling in love with Christ again. That's how you get rid of worldliness, when that starts to creep in. Because as we grow in Christ and in love for Him, our love for the things of the world is going to diminish. They'll simply lose their attracted attraction. We'll not, we will not want to do them like we used to. The pilgrimage of faith begins by separating ourselves from the world, and as we concentrate on Jesus and fellowship with him, when we slip and engage in them, we hate what we do in the weakness of the flesh. Brings us to point number two, the patience of faith. Let's look at verses nine and 10. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. All right, so the second standard of faith mentioned here seems to be somewhat at odds with the first. As a pilgrim, 
Abraham was immediately willing to give up his homeland, his friends, his business, his religion, essentially everything. And he wasted no time putting all these things behind him, but faith also has a time for waiting and for being patient. Now, dwelling in tents was the way of travelers and nomads. Even in Abraham's time, tents were not considered permanent residences. Not only Abraham, but also his son and grandson, Isaac and Jacob, lived out their lives in tents. They were in the land of God that God had promised, but they did not settle down in it. Those great patriarchs, in fact, would, would never possess the land except by faith. The land was in sight, but it was not in hand, let me put it that way. Near as it was, the land was still only a promise. Abraham did not build any houses or cities. He lived in an alien. He lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. So as a transient in the land, he had to be patient. Because the land was promised to him, uh, patience must have been all the harder. He may have needed patience in Herod as well, but he never expected to possess Herod because that, that was never promised. All the rest of his life, however, Abraham walked up and down the land that God promised him, yet never owned more than a small plot in which he was able to bury his wife Sarah. It was promised, but it was never possessed. Abraham's faith required a great deal of patience in order to live without grumbling as an alien in his own land. See, Abraham waited patiently for the reality, for the, pardon me, for the really valuable things. Um, he never saw God's promise fulfilled. He just waited patiently to see that. Um, he waited and waited and waited. Often the hardest times for us as believers are the in-between times, the times of waiting. We're tempted to say, even to God, you know, promises, promises. Abraham, you know, he spent, he spent a great deal of time waiting. Waited long years for the son of promise who finally was given. He waited all his life for the land of promise, which was never given. Yet he waited, he watched, he worked in the patient belief that God's faithful. See, and think about it. If we knew that Christ was coming in a month, we would give full attention to forsaking sin. We would pray like we'd never prayed before, witness like we'd never witnessed before, serve and, and do other things, and be about our Heavenly Father's business. To devote a whole month entirely to the Lord would not be so hard if we knew that it would all be over soon, okay? But to be about His business month after month, year after year, when there's promises seemingly no nearer being fulfilled than when we started, that, that takes patience. You know, William Carey, You've probably heard of him. He was a missionary to India. He only saw a handful of co uh, converts um, when he first started ministering over there. And but patience. And now, you know, many many years later, he sees that because of his uh, what he planted there, there's hundreds of thousands of converts to Christianity now. But when he first started, he had to plant a seed. He he had to he had to to wait and, and be patient. See, the, the, the secret of Abraham's patience was his hope in the ultimate fulfillment of the promise of God. His ultimate promised land was heaven, just as ours is as well. And even the, had he possessed the land of Canaan in his lifetime, it would not have been his ultimate inheritance. He was patient because his eyes were on the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So as important as the earthly land was to him and, and to God's promise, he looked up toward the heavenly land, which he knew he would inherit without fail. So in one sense, it, it's possible to be so heavily minded that we're no earthly good. You've heard that expression before. But in a much deeper sense, it's impossible to be of any real earthly good unless we are heavenly minded. Only the heavenly minded will have the patience to continue faithful in God's work when it becomes hard or, or un unappreciated or, or, or um, it never seems like it's going to end. There's no greater cure for discouragement, fatigue, or self-pity than to think of being in the presence of the Lord one day. Amen? Spending eternity with Him. All right, so moving on to point number three, the power of faith. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Verse 12, therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which by the seashore. Okay, so point number three is the power of faith. You know, faith is powerful. Amen? Faith sees the invisible, it hears the inaudible, it touches the intangible, and it accomplishes the impossible. Unfortunately, some faith is all talk and never really gets down to action. True faith is active, powerfully active. 
See, faith was, was active in the miracle of Isaac's birth. From the human standpoint, it was impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have a child. I mean, you think about it. We know we've discussed this many times. I mean, my goodness, the age that he was. By the time she was 90 years of age, she was obviously far beyond the proper time of life for childbearing. Yet at that age, she conceived and gave birth to the promised son. And the Genesis account gives no indication that Sarah ever showed much faith in God. Both Abraham and Sarah on different occasions had laughed at God's prom promise of a son in their old age. But Sarah had even taken matters in her own hand by persuading Abraham to have a son through her maid Hagar. We know how that worked out. She did not trust God's promise and she was bent on doing things her own way, which, as she soon found out, was not the way either of obedience or of happiness. Uh, her idea and Abraham's <laughs> acquiescence, if that pronouncing that right, him basically agreeing to go along with that, produced a son, Ishmael whose descendants from that day to this have been a plague on the descendants of the Son of Promise. Ishmael became the, the, basically the father of the, of the Arab nations, and every Jew since his birth has faced the antagonism of the Arab world because of Abraham and Sarah's disobedience. Sarah's impatience was costly. You know, when we study Hebrews 11, 11 carefully, um, we discover that the faith mentioned here does not apply to Sarah, rather, but for her. Received ability to conceive means literally to lay down seed. A woman, however, does not lay down the seed that produces conception. That phrase, therefore, obviously has to refer to Abraham, making him the understood subject of the sentence. Looking further at the Greek, we see that that word for herself is a dative of accomplishment or association, and basically means only self. The her is supplied by translators from the context. In other words, the verse could read, He that is Abraham, in association with Sarah, received power to lay down seed. Uh, the, the, the faith was Abraham's, not Sarah's. Through Abraham's faith, God miraculously fulfilled his promise. Uh, verse 12, of course, we read there, uh, Abraham had children upon children. The whole of the people of Israel, every Jew that has ever been and ever will be born, is a result of Abraham's faith. Such is the power of faith. Abraham's faith was in God. It was God's promise of a special son and of innumerable, I'll get that out, descendants was the basis of Abraham's faith. Jesus said in Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to him who believes. Uh, Matthew 19, 26, uh, with God, all things are possible. God's power and God's will are on one side. Man's trust is on the other. So whatever we know to be God's will, Faith has the power to accomplish. If God is unable to meet any of our needs, it's simply because we do not entrust them to Him. He gives us many things for which we, uh, we we never ask and of which we are often unaware of. But many other things, especially spiritual blessings, He's promised we cannot receive because we're not open to them. Paul claimed in Philippians four thirteen, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and He reminds us of Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, Ephesians chapter uh, 3 and verse 20. God's power is for us to claim according to his will. That the things claimed seem impossible has no bearing on the matter. The only hindrance to fulfillment is a lack of faith. Brings us to point number four, the positiveness of faith. The positiveness of faith. Uh, let's read verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. We were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Amen. All right, so not Abraham, Isaac, or, ja or Jacob ever possessed the promised land. In fact, it was almost 500 years later after Jacob had died that Israel first began to possess the land of Canaan. So all those died in faith without receiving the promises. So far from being a lament, however, this statement is a positive declaration that these men died in perfect hope and assurance of fulfillment. For the person of faith, God's promise is as good as the reality. His promise of the glory ahead was as encouraging and certain 
to the patriarchs as actually possessing it could have been. These men of faith did not know what was happening. God had given them no inside information, no word as to when or how the promises would be fulfilled. He only gave the promises, and that was enough. They had a sampling of the promised land. They, they walked on it. They, they pastured their flocks on it. They raised their children on it, but they were not impatient to possess it. It was enough to possess it from a distance because their primary concern was for a better country that is a heavenly one. In the meantime, they were happy, quite happy to be strangers and exiles on the earth. In the ancient world, strangers were often regarded with hatred, suspicion, and contempt. They had few rights even by the standards of that day. They were also exiles, pilgrims, sojourners. They were refugees in their, in their own promised land. But these faithful patriarchs were passing through Canaan to a better place, and they didn't mind. The most positive thing about our faith is not what we can see or hold or measure, but the promise that one day we will forever be with the Lord. Amen? Christians whose faith does not extend to heaven will have their eyes on the things of this world and will wonder why they're not happier with the Lord. Nothing in this life, including God's most abundant earthly blessings, will give a believer the satisfaction and joy that comes from such absolute assurance of future glory. David declared one thing, this is Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I've asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Job, after unbelievable trials and destruction and illness, could say in Job 19, 25, 26, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. See, it is people of such faith that God blesses. He's not ashamed to be called to God, for he's prepared a city for them. Uh, regardless of what, we, of what we are in ourselves, if we trust him, God is not ashamed to be called our God. He says in 1 Samuel 2.30, those who honor me, I will honor. The patriarchs, they honored God, and God honored them. Nothing is so honoring to him as the life of faith. In fact, nothing honors him but the life of faith. And finally, that brings us to point number five, which we read in verses 17 through 19, the proof of faith. Let's read verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Okay, so the proof of Abraham's faith was his willingness to give back to God everything that he had, including the son of promise, whom he had miraculously received because of his faith. After all the waiting and the wondering, the son had been given by God. Then, before the son was grown, God asked for him back. And Abraham obeyed. That's, that's just incredible right there. Abraham knew that the covenant, which could only be fulfilled through Isaac, was unconditional. He knew, therefore, that God would do whatever was necessary, including raising Isaac from the dead to keep that covenant intact. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead. The thought of sacrificing Isaac must have grieved Abraham tremendously, but he knew that he would have his son back. He knew that God would not, in fact, could not take his son away permanently, or else he would have to go back on his own word, which is impossible. See, if Noah illustrates the duration of faith, Abraham shows the depth of faith. Uh, in, in, in tremendous monumental faith, Abraham brought Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and prepared to offer him to God. He believed in resurrection from the dead even before God even had revealed the doctrine of resurrection from the dead. He had, he had to believe in resur resurrection because God, if God allowed him to carry out the command to sacrifice Isaac, resurrection was the only way that God was going to keep his promise. Well, as it turned out, however, because he did not actually die, Isaac became only a type of the resurrection. He was offered, but he was not slain. God provided a substitute. It was the fact that Abraham offered up Isaac that proved his faith. The final standard of faith, its real proof, is willingness to sacrifice. Uh, Matthew 16, 24, If anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus commands to let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Romans 12, 1, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You know, you're familiar, of course, with John Bunyan. He was in jail for preaching the gospel. He was deeply concerned about his family. He was particularly grieved 
about his little blind daughter for whom he had a special love. And he wrote, he said, I saw in this condition, I was a man who was pulling down his house upon the head of his wife and children. Yet, thought I, I must do it. I must do it. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. See, the patriarchs, therefore, they held to the, to the five great standards of faith that we've just discussed this morning. It's pilgrimage in separation from the world. It's patience in waiting for God uh, to work. It's power in doing the impossible. It's positiveness in focusing on God's eternal promise and its proof, which is found in obedient sacrifice. So bless God, I trust that you learned something this morning as we've gone through uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We're gonna pick it up next week by looking at verse 20, uh, getting into Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. So praise God, thank you for being here today and have a great rest of the day. Enjoy the balance of your day. God bless you, you're dismissed.